Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. What's going on, folks? Welcome back to another episode of the Bloody Water Podcast. Sean Strickland took a big risk. However, he reaped a great reward. He got a TKO finish over Abus Magomedov. One of the rare times you see these Magomedov guys lose in MMA, but that's neither here nor there. We had some upsets. This was one of those cards, folks, where you never count out MMA. You don't just look at the numbers. You don't look at the favorites and say, yeah, all chalk. Lots of upsets here. Lots of new contenders. Lots of new prospects. Lots of stuff to talk about so folks breaking it down with me as always is my co-host the santa fe bomber himself the new mexico native aj off air we were talking it was a little bit of a rough weekend admittedly we're gonna get into it in a second but what did this event teach you Derek, this event teach me man that mma itself provides the highest of highs and the yeah. lowest of lows man going from a good week last week to not the hottest week folks check it out you can see on the bottom over there i don't know if Derek's ready to say it but homeboy won the week on a very interesting week so it was uh like you said Derek you can never count out the underdogs even going into the third round with the live underdog the live odds they're putting it there still anything can happen that's why we love this game Derek and it makes yeah. me more excited to break it down with you brother how you feeling after this absolutely weekend? I mean I'm feeling good and the reason why I'm not announcing this oh yeah won the week is because this wasn't an impressive week to win right <laughs> here I mean the bar was pretty low for both of us so I'm more interested about how we learn from this event and how we talk about our picks moving forward because the logic was right on a lot of these however the outcome just did not go as planned so neither here nor there but folks we are an accountability show this is the bloody water podcast and if you have not dropped a subscription yet we're almost at 600 subscribers so do us a solid this is the the season of giving right maybe that's later in the year this is the summertime no we feel good drop a subscription aj um listen tell the people real quick um before we get into the stuff where can they find you on twitch all of the good stuff and then we'll jump into the picks Twitch.tv slash Santa Fe Bomber, folks. Go check it out as well as go check out Derek on Twitter uh, at D49. Derek, say your Twitter, man. I don't know how I messed it up. Well, listen, I was going to say you can follow me on Twitter, guys, at D496 underscore, but you probably missed me this weekend on Twitter with the live tweets. I don't know if you saw the fiasco, AJ, but Elon Musk was like, Twitter rate limits. Y'all could see 600 posts a day or whatnot. So basically, I couldn't see what was happening this weekend. Maybe we all needed a good social media break that's neither here nor there but you heard the man you know what i'm saying talk to me aj and the big thing folks even with that even with the the twitter limits and all that the biggest thing go jump in subscribe jump in the comments hit me up yeah. on twitch and join the community that was the biggest part of what i want to say we're building a community here derek said it almost 600 f- uh, subscribers on youtube just pumping that uh, numbers up even more and the best way to get the most info out of this show out of everything we do is joining that community and spreading the love like Derek said it's it may not be the season to give him, but it's summer love over here. So spread that love all day long. Hit those buttons and let's keep it rolling. That's right. And let's talk about this uh, recap, folks. So as you can see, there's a lot of red here. We don't like to see all of that red. But the good news is that at least we got a couple of wins on the board, right? Sean Strickland, Grant Dawson on my side. But AJ, he actually hit on the one that wasn't surprising to a lot. But to me, this one was one of those. Now Michael Morales is official. Now you passed the test. AJ, how impressed were you with that victory in a short note before we actually cover it? Derek, very impressed that he was able to solidify himself in that position. That was kind of... uh we'll cover it a little bit more but solidarity is where i was happiest with him and i my comment on this one is he got rocked a little bit in the first one i swole up and he said all right let me turn it on let me stop playing around with you guys right uh aside from that the big miss i will say there's really two big misses on this one i would say for us both melissa gato and ismael bonfim now we're going to talk about those in a second but folks that's why i say you cannot just trust a name uh, you cannot trust a, pr- a fancy pretty record and there's a lot more that goes into it but that's neither here nor there let's talk about some props aj equally rough night on the props one in five i hit on the dawson decision at plus 190 folks i'm going to touch on that a little bit further i'm actually surprised morales decision plus 125 you nailed that one bro this is not a guy who's a decision fighter this is not a guy who a lot of people probably thought would go to the judges what gave you that hunch was it just the toughness of max griffin Absolutely, Derek. The toughness and uh, fortitude that Max Griffin presents. There's a reason he rocks pain on the mouthpiece. This boy's right. willing to be in there. That's right. I mean, old chiseled veteran right there. And uh, with that being said, this is your last opportunity, folks. It's really not. You can subscribe at any time. But do it now. Go ahead. Subscribe now. Let's talk about these main card fights, baby. Let's get it. Have you seen that replay, buddy? Your head was bouncing around like a pinball machine. It's time for some main card breakdown. Courtesy of your hosts, Derek G and AJ. 
Sean Strickland is a bad man, and I think it's easy to say I give up when I have a finger halfway lodged down my eyeball. We just saw that, right, last week with Justin Taffa. You get a nasty eye poke, you can call it quits. He mentioned in the post-fight presser, AJ, how impressed were you about this, or just what were your thoughts? He mentioned in the post-fight presser, yeah, I almost was all like, yeah, I'm going to take the, the easy way out right here. I'm going to take the coward's way out. But I heard y'all guys talking in the crowd and all that. And I was like, you know what? I got to give it to him. That's the type of guy Strickland is, at least the persona. I mean, what did you make of all that? The the one thing you got to love about Sean Strickland is he is always himself, unapologetically unabashed. And that is really his truest form coming out after the fight. Always with Sean Strickland's post-fight press conferences. They're a little less wild than his pre-fight pressers, but it's because he's trying to stir up that storm, and then you see his true self after the fact, and that's really him. He does have a lot of pride in himself and you know all the, all the things he stands behind, so you got to love that, man. You got to yeah. support it, and we've all been there when you're in a fight, sitting there, and you're like, do I really want to do this? Good thing Sean Strickland, he's a man of his word, and he knuckles up. Now, let's talk about the actual fight, right? So, Abu Smagomedov, he came out hot. That teep kick was looking nice. He was looking sharp, just like how he did in his last fight against Dustin Stoltzfus, right? Came out sharp, hot, heavy. And Strickland, just kind of reading the patterns, right? Okay, all right, you gave me a little something. I'm going to just kind of, you know, hand fight a little bit, play this, play that. After the eye poke... In a weird twist of events, it felt like Magomedov almost was a little more rattled than Strickland was. Like, Strickland turned it into, all right, let's go. Come on, bro. I got one eye, double vision. I'm just going to go scrap, right? What do you think that is? Do you think that's just countless rounds from Sean Strickland? Or do you think that Magomedov was like, okay, now I got to really think because if my hands are outstretched, I'm going to lose a point. That was a hard warning. Like, I feel like those things can get to you, especially the fight hasn't even started yet. Like, you know, you haven't warmed up to each other. What do you think? I think uh, it's a little mixture of both. I mean, Sean Strickland, rounds after rounds after rounds. This dude down to fight anybody. He's seen it all, done it all. So that right there adds a big swath to the Sean Strickland uh, canvas. But Magomedov, what I think happened right there, he sees Sean Strickland not get demoralized with the eye poke. He sees the big shots that are that he's throwing that normally have a big effect on people. And Sean Strickland, like you said, just hand fighting, just blocking things, reading things, looking nice out there, seeing them before they hit, and then still being in your face. I think that really demoralized Magomedov, and you saw it happen, especially in the second round where he just started, instead of throwing anything back, he just started shelling up, curling down, looking up at the clock, turning away. That demoralization, I think, really started to turn the tide for Sean Strickland. What do you think? Yeah, no, that's a fair point. I, I mean, at the end of the day, it is the classic time-tested approach of Sean Strickland that says – you can be really tough for this first round. You can have, he won the first round. He got the takedown. He's like, you could be really tough for this first round, but I'm going to go at the same methodical pace all five rounds. And if you can't match my pace, you're going to start getting tired. You're going to start breaking and I'm going to be right there in your face. And that's where it was, right? He crunched the offense. He crunched the space of Magomedov. So those big kicks and the big explosive attacks couldn't get off. Next thing you know, I mean, bro, running backwards, backpedaling, it's tiring, man. So you're sitting there backwards. Now you hit the cage. Oh, shoot, I have nowhere else to go. And Strickland, I think the most impressive part, man, and this is what we see it over and over again, but he doesn't load up. He's just like, all right, I'm just going to pepper, 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 pepper. And then when Magomedov started crumbling, that's when he put the big shots on. So it really did feel like this could have been just a conventional sparring session for Sean Strickland. But that goes to show there's levels to this game. And that's kind of the point that I was trying to make in the pre-show. So what did you learn about Magomedov um, from this matchup? He's He is the real deal, Derek. This guy has a future in the UFC. He has a future in the sport. But like you said, there's levels to this game. And if Magomedov can work on the in-betweens of the flash that he has, because he has power, he has flash, he has the technique to get done. But the in-betweens, the, the calmness, the clarity that is provided with those rounds and rounds and mm -hmm. rounds and rounds of sparring – that's where we're going to see this dude grow. And that's really what I learned. He's still still a little green to be facing one of the top 10 in the division. You know what? I would agree with you. I think he's like, what, 29 years old? Dude got like 40 mm -hmm. fights on his record. Like, give my man another opportunity. You feel me? Let's not give him the Sean Strickland. Let's give him someone a little bit lower, but a little higher than Stoltzfus. Um, this is the big point that I wanted to bring here, man. I think we all owe Sean Strickland an apology. Everybody who was not on the train of... 
Um, if Magomedov tries to grapple with him, Sean Strickland would be uh, hopeless, right? Like, everybody that was on that train, y'all need to all apologize. Because this is what I was saying. This dude is a black belt. He just decides not to use the grappling. So when we got to some of those scenarios where Magomedov was trying to break out the wrestling and Sean Strickland did, like, the most technical, conventional, just stand back up, break the grip, get back out in space. Come on, man. This is, leads to my next question here. What is the next move for Sean Strickland? Does he get lucky and able to kind of slip through the cracks in the matchmaking to where he gets an Izzy shot? No, I don't think they're going to give him <laughs> Izzy there. Unfortunately, I still think Sean Strickland's going to get a little bit of the shaft in that aspect. Uh, there, I don't think there's much draw for that fight. Is uh, Sean Strickland, I think we give him somewhere in the top five, somewhere working his way up. And it's hard because the whole, the whole uh, division is a little stagnant. So I can see why he had to fight so deep in the in the pool of uh, Abus Magomedov. I don't know, though, Derek. I was trying to think of a name that would really come up in the uh, in the division. And I don't really have anything that's clamoring. Do you? Paulo Costa. How about that? That'd be fun. All right. Ooh. I think it'd be fun. I, I think that that's uh, two guys who are fun talkers who will really get down, and it's a serious power jujitsu on Costa side. And then Strickland, like I said, it's just the nonstop pepper you down. And Paulo Costa likes to be or is willing to be lured into a scrap as well. I don't think that's a massive outreach on either side. I think it's a very good fight and it would be a very close fight as well. Now, let me just pull this up real quick just so I can kind of uh, maybe see a little bit. Well, Paulo Costa, uh, if he has something locked up, Paulo Costa... All right, well, that's going to take a little bit longer. So while we tread on this, AJ, just give us one last point while I go look this up. Man, I think the biggest the biggest takeaway I have from this whole fight, Derek, is you cannot discount the consistency that Sean Strickland fights at. He is he's composed, calm, and when he's in that kind of chaos, he's able to maintain that calmness and really push forward. I had a buddy at work, one of the one of the upper management guys, talking to me. He's like, "I think Sean Strickland's going to absolutely put it to this guy." And for a second, you know that that kind of it's like, yeah, I mean, I can see how Sean Strickland would do that. But what impressed me most, yeah, he did put it to this guy, but he stayed consistently and will always be that same kind of style of fighter. Did you pull it up, Derek? I got it. I got it. No, you're right on that point. That is, that is the the tried and true aspect of Sean Strickland until it doesn't work like against Alex Paeta, but neither here nor there. Um, yeah, so I forgot, man. Paulo Costa, he's actually matched up with Ikram Alaskerov, and I don't know if you remember that guy, but he he's my man. I think he just knocked out Phil Hawes. Um, yep, it was Ikram. Yeah, he knocked out Phil Hawes. This is a grappler dude who just came out and just knocked his socks off, man. So, uh, yeah, middleweight, it's booked up. Maybe he finds himself in another dilemma where they won't give him a fight for a while. Either way, big win by Sean Strickland in the main event. All right, man. Co-main, Demir Ismagulov versus Grant Dawson. And AJ, there's not too many times where I'm going to put on my Mystic Mac, Mac cap, right? This was one of those times where I have the clip circulating, right? The pre-show clip for Grand Dawson where I said, it's easy to say, yes, Demir Ismagulov. It's an easy pick. But Grand Dawson could easily find himself up two rounds simply with just control time because he can slip and fall into a takedown. Except this time, AJ, he didn't slip and fall. He was methodic. He took Ismagulov down at will. And every single time, man, his grappling and jujitsu is just too technical, too slick, too smooth. And he left no openings. How much of a wake-up call was this for all of the people who were sleeping on Grant Dawson? Uh, not only the people who are sleeping on Grant Dawson, but the people who say a game plan doesn't work. I mean, the old Mike Tyson adage is, is true more often than not. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Unless you're Grant Dawson and you're able to stay true to that game plan and find the ways that are going to make you successful. We say all the time on the show, the best fighter does not always win. Mm -hmm. And Grant Dawson is a true adage to that where he sticks to what he does best and makes it his fight. And like you said, controlled these Magula, took him down at will, made this close, potentially close fight. Not that close. I mean, he he was in control. I don't remember one real moment where I was thinking like, damn, Grand Dawson might get put out right here. This dude stayed safe, stayed in his lane. One of the most admirable things about him, and like you said, Derek, we said it in the intro quote that we have circulating. The game plan and the way this dude stays to it is impeccable. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to talk numbers, Grant Dawson officially with 12 minutes and 24 seconds of control time. Um, takedowns three of five so it was I actually thought it would be worse than that I thought it we're talking about like you know what I mean two for eight two for ten bro three for five 
beat him up on the ground, sick transitions, tried to choke him a couple of times, almost, bro, put him in the nasty, full Nelson, I just embarrassed my man. I'll say this, Demir Ismagulov still, there is no reason to discount my man. This just stylistically, he ran into a guy who's a extreme specialist at what he does. Um, and this was my big fear. Ismagulov, his best chance of winning was keeping it on the feet. But can you ever really open up when you know the threat of the takedown isn't just there, but it's a very real threat. And you know you might not be able to get back up once he takes you down. So after round one, then you say, I got to come out heavy round two. Then you get taken down again. Now round three, you're like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to walk forward and I'm going to get taken down again. And that's exactly what happened, man. So um, Grant Dawson, you beat number 12, right? So you move up the rankings in the lightweight division. Now he's calling out either give me a big name or give me a big rank. What is he most likely to get? A Tony Ferguson type name or a Benny Dariush type rank? What do you think? I think he's more inclined to get a uh, a ranking, a, a more favorable ranking. Maybe not a Bennett or Yush or something like that, because you're right. When he said those two names, I was like, God damn, this guy is shooting for the stars. Hell yeah, Grant Dawson. Keep mm -hmm. pushing it. I don't think you're going to get that. But as long as you're searching high, you'll get something that's higher, or higher than what they would have given you, you know, off the bat when you're asking for nothing. So I think we're going to see him in that top 10, top 8 realm of competition. Who do you think is a good, a really good matchup that's going to give Grant Dawson a closer fight, but still able for still be able for him to shine in his own light? Well, this matchup might not make sense, and this guy that I'm going to bring up is already booked for a fight. But if he can win this fight and he's willing to take on a steep challenge, I'd like to see how Grant Dawson can fare against a long, dangerous, lanky guy like Jalen Turner. Jalen Turner's already matched up with Dan Hooker, and here's the thing. Yeah, you can probably take down Jalen Turner. He's been taken down before, but it's going to be a hell of a time trying to get that takedown when he could hit you from across the cage, bro. What do you think about that one? I like that. And going back to what you're saying about can uh, Demir Magulov stay perfect? You need a big shot. You got to hurt him. Jalen Turner has the ability to hurt you and then really open up, stay at range. So I like that, man, especially... If, if Jalen Turner is just a little sloppy, then Grant Dawson can get on the inside and control him. So there's ways for both fighters to really work that. Sounds like a massive hill for the or sounds like a massive hill fighting against the tarantula. It sure does. But I mean, Gamrod got it done and Gamrod's much smaller, mm -hmm. too. So who's to say Grant Dawson can't get it done? All I'm saying here, this is going to be my final testament for this matchup and for this fighter. Grant Dawson, you had a 19 one in one fighter, hadn't lost in like seven years, right? This dude is plus money, and you know that he just mauls everybody in there. Time to give my man a little bit of respect. That's all I'm saying. Like, let's let's have some more people hop on the Grant Dawson hype train. I just think he deserves it, honestly. But that's neither uh, you nor there once again. All right, man. Big co-main event. Big win for Grant Dawson. And uh, even bigger win right here for Michael Morales, man. This win over Max Payne Griffin is no joke. I'm not discounting this whatsoever. And there's a reason why I picked for Max Griffin, even though I knew it was an underdog long shot. And it's because Michael Morales has a couple tendencies I felt like he needed to sharpen. AJ, Morales looked sharp in this one. Long powerful composed and even hit him a couple times with the flex on him that right hand down the pipe ah. only problem aj impeccable performance do we want to see a couple more hooks from our man morales everything is straight down the pipe man do we want to vary the attack a little bit what do you think or was it flawless to you ah that's it oh i wouldn't say flawless Derek. you need a fat left hand that swelled up your eye so you know you can't say flawless I like the, the straight down the pipe uh, approach that Morales has because it's a lot harder to effectively stop, if you will. Like so the, the classics, there's a reason they're the classics, man. The technique works above all. And when you're throwing those big shots, those big looping shots, if you don't set them up well enough, they you can get countered, you can get caught, people can be faster than you. So I like the fact that Morales has it. So if we want to see a couple more hooks in there, a couple more digs to the body, those things, if he learns to put those on, uh, you know, punch four or five and six, man, he's going to be a killer, a killer. And especially now that he's learned, he can handle a little bit of uh, force coming back at him. He, he can stand there and tag with the big boys. He doesn't need to be skirting on the side of the octagon all the time. Hopefully we, I don't necessarily want to see Michael Morales in wars, but yeah. if he can get in there and slug him up a little bit more, I think his stock's going to raise that much more. What do you think? I think he's he's ready for a challenge, bro. With that type of performance, here's the thing that impressed me the most, man. He was very, very out of position on some of those takedown attempts from Max Griffin. And he just stays up. Like, it felt like I was watching Alex Paeta in there where I'm just like, how, how are you up? How are you up here? Max Griffin has good wrestling. Max Griffin can beat you there. 
But Michael Morales also, and this is where the, the gamesmanship comes in. Some people are saying weight bully, right? Some people are saying, no, you're not, you're not a welterweight, bro. Like you should be, you're middleweight fighting at welterweight. The size discrepancy between these two are pretty evident, right? It's pretty massive. Morales is huge. <laughs> So I think that kind of played into it as well as just pure physical strength. 24 years old, still not even done growing. That's scary, bro. That's a scary prospect right there. The confidence, though, man. You got two Olympic parents, right? His, mo his mom just won pans in uh, uh, judo, Olympic judo right there, right? So it's like, come on, man. You have this type of household in here. This dude is destined to do something fantastic. My question is, how high is his ceiling from, like, watching these past couple of performances, man? This one was a tried-and-true decision. This was, like, a through-and-through, test-yourself three rounds. You couldn't get him out of there. If he can keep fighting like this... You get up on the on points early, bro. It could have been a 30-27, you know what I mean? So what do you think? Yeah, no, I was trying to think of a ceiling for uh, Morales coming in here because his the athleticism he possesses kind of jumps him to the top, man. There was one instance I even had to, like, stop and rewind it for my girl so I can show her. We've been working on shuffles, and this dude cut an angle so fast and so quick on Max Griffin. Griffin didn't even know what happened. He had his hands locked. Next thing you know, the dude's behind him. He's like, what the fuck just mm -hmm. happened? Like, that was wild. So for the fact that the skills that Morales possesses, I'm thinking ceiling, man. We're going to see this dude in the top five within the next year. Maybe a belt. I don't want to say championship yet. I feel, I feel like we always put out that bad juju and then something happens to him. So I don't want to say this guy's getting gold yet, but I yeah. can see top five for sure within the next year. What do you think is the uh, appropriate ceiling is, Derek? Well, I think we're really going to see what Michael Morales is about when we get to that top five, top seven type rankings, because you're going to get a bunch of wrestlers. And then now mm -hmm. you're not just going to be able to beat people up at range. You know, you're going to have to sprawl and brawl. So this was a big win for Morales right here. Uh, everything looked good to me. And then when he did get tagged, because I was like, ooh, see, this is what I'll talk about, Griffin putting it on. As soon as he got tagged, it turned into a different person. And then I think he took the fight much more serious. And then the showboating too, man. It's like, all right, you're entertaining, bro. Like, all right, I, I like this. Big win by Michael Morales right there. And uh, moving on us up, man, to uh, Ariane Lipsky. Picks up a big split decision win against Melissa Gatto. So Melissa Gatto goes from this um, undefeated fighter, right? 8-0-1, I believe, to now 8 two and one in her uh, MMA career, two losses back to back from being undefeated. So then you take a major kind of step down, your hype sizzles out a little bit, but AJ, I can't sit here and deny it. And we need to talk about this. I felt like Gato was the more technical fighter in this bout. I thought that there was a couple IQ mistakes based on matchup style, but she did leave the fight in the best place for Ariane Lipsky to stay competitive, which was just a straight up Muay Thai fight, kickboxing fight, you know what I mean? Do you think, let's talk about visuals, but do you think that Ariane Lipsky, 10 out, of 10, 10 out of 10 times, wins this matchup against Gato? No, Derek, not at all. And, and as close as this is to Ariane Lipsky being the previous self she was outside of the UFC, getting knockouts, getting all that stuff, she even mentioned on her post-fight press conference, everyone's asking her, when are you going to get knockouts again? When are you going to be the queen of violence again? I don't think we're going to see that resurgence come about because of the fact you're talking about. She's so technically strong in there, and that's going to propel her a lot further than the flashy knockouts and stuff. But to your point, I'd say a five times out of ten, these fighters trade back and forth. I mean, there's no, nothing to shake your head at in the performance Melissa Gatto had besides the fact she did not use her strength. And sometimes when you're in there, you try for a takedown once, you do, your, you do what you think is going to work best – and it doesn't work out. And the next thing you know, you get hip tossed and you're in a position where you're like, I'm supposed to be the one doing this. OK, I'm good on the ground. I have submissions. She's back out now in her fight. You're like, damn, I'm out of my realm again. And I think just the not the necessarily the head games, but the mental warfare that was being taken place. I think Melissa Gatto expected to be the one on the, the better end of it. But it just the cards were in favor of Lipsky in this fight. The thing that was really interesting to me is if you check this out, you'll notice that uh, you have Melissa Gatto in blue and then you have Ariane Lipsky in red here. Melissa Gatto outstruck her two of three rounds. It was dead even in the third round, right? She outstruck her in two rounds. If you look at the numbers, significant strikes, 85 for Gatto, 66 for Ariane Lipsky. Takedowns, um, let me see, where's the takedowns at? Takedowns, one of one for Lipsky, and to your point, zero of seven for Gato. So that was just kind of my thing, is that from a visual perspective, I'm like, okay. And this is also, I think, in part because the commentate, uh, the broadcast team was just doing nothing but talking about Melissa Gato. Look how she's just laying that jab on her, that one. I mean, that one-two down the pipe was beautiful, right? 
it just felt like I'm like, man, Gato should probably squeak this one out. She did win one of the cards on the split, but when they give it to Lipsky, Lipsky looked more confident. She at the end of the fight, she looked like the winner. But this was just—is this not one of those weird ones? Why do the numbers not add up in this one? Yeah, I'm not sure, Derek. And I think the numbers don't add up because it was such a close fight. And one of the big things that swayed in favor of Lipsky was the visuals. Mm -hmm. Gato's on the ground. Gato's got her back towards the mat. Everything's looking. Uh, got, uh, Lipsky's able to pull away, hit some big shots, and look like the tide's in her favor. And I think that's where the numbers kind of skew because it seemed like a lot closer fight. But apparently, got, I mean... We saw it in the takedowns. Gato not able to do her bread and butter yeah. kind of leads to a, a faulty performance, if you will. And that's the thing, too, is when you think, oh, I'm touching her up, man. I know I'm hitting her. You're in your head. You're counting. I know I'm landing more than she's landing. You're thinking you're winning. I don't really need to use my jujitsu as much. And that's the thing, man. Don't stray away from the thing that that gets you to gets you to where you're at the bread and butter right there this was an impressive win by ariani lipsky um and just to see how she's stringing them together man this seems like a career resurgence a little bit right here so my final point before we move on ariani lipsky give it a year uh, where is she at is she ranked what do you think Ooh, yes give it a year i do think she's ranked maybe even cracking that top 12 like I said, we're not going to see the Ariane Lipsky of old that's just cracking people left and right, dropping girls and just leave them in their dust. Mm -hmm. We are going to see a more refined, a more technical, a more calm Ariane Lipsky, which will probably, at least in my opinion, advance her further in her career. Okay, fair enough. Big win by the queen of violence, Ariane Lipsky. An even bigger win once again, man. Benoit Saint Denis, the god of war, man. He came in with a spectacular game plan, and he shut down one of the most hyped fighters um, that we have on the roster right now. One of the Bonfim brothers, Ismael Bonfim. Now, when you come out and you're normally used to a feeling out approach, or oh, he's going to come on hot, and when Benoit Saint Denis comes out and just throws like six rear kicks over and over and over again, and you're just like, yeah, come on, keep going. I mean, what are you thinking at that point? It's like, what what kind of game plan does my man have right here, right? So I thought, big kickboxing matchup for uh, this fight. Were you surprised when Benoit St. Denis said, oh, yeah, by the way, I got some grappling too. Let's get it, baby. What do you think? I was not surprised at all, Derek. It seemed like a calculated setup. I'm going to up, beat up that bread basket all day long. Even if you're coming forward telling me what's, you know, come on, let's bring it. Show me I can kick you in the stomach, in the liver. That liver can only take so much. I mean, and I think the game plan was to wear down the power and the stamina mm -hmm. that uh, Bonfim had. And it sure seemed well enough to work because once uh, Saint Denis was able to get control, the strength he had seemed to be levels and above. He was controlling it. And it wasn't even under the chin, the squeeze. He was just squeezing for dear life. And man, uh, Benoit, I don't have much to say besides Benoit Saint Denis is a real deal that a lot of people should be hyped on coming forward, man. I'm excited to see this dude fight. The power level these guys had is insane. Yeah, and this is another one where 10 out of 10 times, I don't think that Benoit Saint Denis maybe wins this matchup, but I think that his game plan was phenomenal because I do think it was less of a, I want to beat up your liver and more of a, you know what is really sharp for Bonfim? That right hand. How do I take away that right hand? I'm going to kick you in your arm. You're going to block it and I'm just going to deaden your arm. So now you have no pop on that right hand and now we're getting into these exchanges and now I can, I can hang out in the pocket a little bit more than I would have been able to before. He mentioned, he was like, this was my Muay Thai coach's game plan right here. This was not a grappling oriented game plan but when it got to the grappling the thing that surprised me the most man is Bonfim I just think he's a little bit better than he displayed in that moment because there was a couple opportunities where he immediately once your back starts getting taken and they start putting the choke hand in there you start fighting off the choke hand whatever hand is like if you're and it's hard to kind of describe here but if I have somebody's back and I'm laying on my side and my left arm is the closest arm to the mat that's the arm that I want to use to choke my opponent so if I'm being choked i want to fight that hand off there was points where saint denis had one arm over and then bonfim has one hand just kind of chilling on the mat and he's not hand fighting at all and that's why i was confused because i was like i know it's in the moment and things happen super quick and i've been there too trust me where they're like why didn't you fight the hand I'm like I, I don't know but he just didn't fight the hand and then bonfim or not uh, saint denis got the choke opportunity and that's the scariest part aj it does not matter if it's underneath the chin because anything underneath the nose is the chin so when you feel like you're getting your jaw literally broken at a certain point you saw it. he put the hand up and then i was like oh it's over and then he's like 
Ah, that's it. And I was like, <laughs> you know my man was pissed off. You know Bonfim was like, what a shit performance right here. But that goes to show, execute a game plan. Once again, it works, right? This, so, AJ, testament. This card was almost about just who can ex- execute their game plan correctly first. Would you agree? 100%, Derek. This is a night for the uh, the surprising because not a lot of people think that game plan works. And this fight card was an absolute testament to that. Plus 600 to mission prop, man. I mean, that's juice right there. I'm pretty sure we both had TKO for Bonfim. And if we were going St. Denis, we're probably still going to go TKO for St. Denis. But, I mean, do you see more of this coming out of St. Denis' game? More of the, I'm just going to grapple? Because he's not like a pure grappler. That's the thing. But he is a hell of a grappler. So what do you think? I see exactly more of this uh, game plan going forward. Beat him up. Show him your power. Hurt him. Take him to the ground. Choke him out. That's Classic right. club and sub, baby. Classic club and sub right there. And another very surprising victory right here. My man, Nurse Sultan. Ruzi Boyev. I still butcher it. I'm still going to call him Nurse Sultan. But AJ, man, this was the one that I feel the worst about because I told you. I was like, I'm high on this guy. Like, this guy's good. Can he get it done on short notice? You saw how tall, long, lanky he was. Like Everything played into his hand. I cannot be the only one that was surprised to see Bruno Fajeda just eat a massive like get his his what was it a kick caught dropped and just eat the massively timed hand shot down and then a couple ground pound and it was over i felt like this fight should not have taken place that way but it did i mean what do you think Derek, this is where i knew i was gonna have a rough night of fights right mm-hmm. here my picks were gonna be all over the wire because the fact that nur sultan was able to catch a kick hit Bruno Faeda, but also hit him so hard that both feet lifted off the air. He was out before yeah. he hit the ground, bro. It was wild how strong and how big Nur Sultan came to that fight. I'm I'm literally, I was shocked, and I knew. I was like, oh, shit, this is going to be a rough night for everybody. Like, damn, bro, this dude came out in his UFC debut in a short-notice fight and gets a finish like that. Bro, this is uh, – I'm excited to see where Nur Sultan comes. We're going to have to learn the name, Derek. We're going to have to get yeah. John Anik's phonetical pronunciation because yeah. this guy has a lot of uh, juice left behind the gears, if you will. I'll say this, though, man. I mean, Nur Sultan's not a huge guy. I think he came in at like 183 in terms of a weight, right? He's long. He's big. So he could hit Faeda from way pl- – Faeda just couldn't close the distance, right? So when he tried to close with a kick, a blind kick, you get it caught. Dude got long legs. I just felt like the timing was immaculate right there, and I felt like if – once again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. 10 out of 10 times, I don't think that this is the outcome that we're going to get, man. I really don't. I think that if Fajeda even had an opportunity to land something, we would have had a much different fight here. But, I mean, he capitalized, man, and people are going to call him a big problem here. I just think once he gets to an opponent who matches his frame a little closer, because he's the tallest middleweight actively right now. Um, so once we get somebody who can match his frame a little bit, who's a little more experienced... I think that that's when those holes are going to show. But this dude, I mean, Nur Sultan, TKL round one, flawless victory. What else can you say? Don't throw blind kicks. That's about it. Yeah, that's a fair (laughs) point, too. Easier said than done when, like I said, dude can hit you from across the cage. But um, listen, that is your main card breakdown. UFC Vegas 76 was a testament to let us know always stay on your toes never get comfortable never just think that you know it all because this was a rough uh night rough weekend here at the bloody water podcast but to no avail because at the end of the day right this is just one week and we still got six months of action left where we're bringing it to you aj if i have to pull it up right now um i just let me just see real quick because this is going to be important hold on let's see what we can do um do i got it Yes, sir. All right. So the numbers as it stands right now, AJ, I am at 55.05% in terms of accuracy ratings, and you are at 60.55%, my friend. So both of us, even though we're striving for much higher, loftier goals, at the end of the day, 55% plus club right here. AJ, any words on that before we move on? Woo! And I think the the biggest word that speaks to that, folks, is consistency right here. There's no other show that does it two shows a week, week in, week out, covering everything, and as well as providing a little entertainment, man. Join the community. I'll, I'll beat a dead horse so Derek doesn't have to hit that subscribe button, folks. Come on. That's right. Hit the subscribe button and uh, let's follow along for some of the other action that took place, not on the main card, but still worthy to talk about. 
And AJ, this is kind of a sad one. I think we're gonna we're gonna have to kick this one off in kind of a, a sad fashion. I'm trying to look through real quick. I don't have any sad music. That's probably almost too dramatic to even play right now. But uh, the return of Kevin Lee did not quite go as expected. Now, AJ, we know that it's not fair to give some of these guys their matchups and their and their welcome back, um, you know, fight. Right? Kevin Lee gets Renat Fakhradinov who he considered to be on a Hamza Chemayev-esque level, and it looked that way. When you beat up Kevin Holland, you hit him with the big right hand, and then you choke him to sleep in, like, 20 seconds. Um, AJ, we might have a problem on our hands here in this division. How impressive was this Fakhradinov win, or did we just never see Kevin Lee get to get going at all? It's weird because Kevin Lee, he had the, after the Gregor Gillespie performance, and I think there was another one after that where he kind of, seemed like he was coming back to that Motown phenom he used to be. And then the Eagle FC kind of things happen. He's in this like lost state. And it really seemed like a, a older relic coming to fight the new guys and the speed, bro. The speed of which uh, Fakhra Dinov was able to land the shots. This was another point where I thought Kevin Lee was out before he hit the ground. I mean, he wasn't. That's why the choke had to come in. But the power and the speed that Fakhra Dinov had on that counter was perfect bro beautiful and like you said there you got to feel bad for kevin lee i mean didn't and agreed i don't think he had enough time to get going but it's because the speed and power of fakir dina was so fast he just wasn't ready for it it's like when you're going and you're playing you know let's say you're playing jv Mm -hmm. and then you jump up to varsity and you're like damn these boys are fast Mm -hmm. well that's what kevin lee ran into except it is in a closed cage and it just happened to be you know 55 seconds so yeah i think that the other thing too is that when you kind of uh build somebody up in your head and you're like this this vicious nasty wrestler that's all you're thinking about and then you get caught with the right hand you're like oh shit i was i didn't even for, remember the right hand right there i was too worried about the shot coming in and then you get choked it was just a bad luck because how dramatic it was like your his body jumped it was a dead body on the floor basically right there that was that was a rough one but all right man um it's one of those where I don't really, I'm not too mad about eating my words here because I'm glad she got the win. Carol Hosa, she got the big win over Yana Santos, man. Another close one, another close one where you thought Santos could have squeezed this one out. It was a split decision, but Carol Hosa got it done. Hosa looked big, very big in there for 145. This is really my question, man. Yana Santos, at this point, man, we're, we're dropping a few in a row, you know, and we need another big win on the board. I mean, this was at 145, so I'm not sure why we're still doing these fights, but what is the future of Yana Santos? That's what I was going to ask there. And to answer your question first, the future of Yana Santos at this division, I think, is good. Any other division, we'll see where she goes. We'll see if the, the skill level has surpassed where she was. But I think that they're really trying to pump this 145 class to get more girls in and get the kind of build going again. Now that Nunez is gone, there's room for to grow. There's room for growth for the rest of the division. I think that's why we're seeing more 145 fights, Derek. Why do you think we're seeing some some would say a resurgence of the 145 class? Or is it just this just a placeholder just because? No, I don't. I actually don't think that's what it is. I think that if you already, you're not booking fights, you know, a week in advance, right? You book them way in advance. So I think that Nunez retired. They already had some fights booked, and they're like, all right, well, we have to get you guys contractually. We have to get you guys fights. So here's your fights right here, and then we're gonna fight out your contract, and then 145 close down. All you guys get the boot, and I think it's gonna be as simple as that. Honestly, um, sad to say because these are talented fighters, but also n- entertainment level that wasn't that wasn't very high. Um, AJ, biggest upset that we've seen in forever. Elvis Brenner, man, over Guram Kutataladze, bro. Like, this is one of the shoot, uh, uh, shoot the box boys, man. This is a man with no quit, even though he had a two inch gash in his forehead from a nasty elbow from Guram. You have to feel terrible for Kutataladze because this is a man who's been trying to get a fight, visa issues. If it's not one thing, it's the next, right? And I felt like, and this was a short notice fight, too. I felt like this was just one of those he needed to get into the cage and then he got screwed on over in this situation because his cardio did not look up to par. He did not look like the normal Guram Kutataladze we no- were used to uh, watching. And Brenner looked like a man that had nothing to lose. So, like, what did you make of that whole fiasco? Man, there's a reason why this one is a sleeper, folks, because there's so much behind it. And that you just said, Derek, short notice fight, looking like he's a little off, not getting visa issues, man. And Brenner, not really the most hyped of fighters, this dude's a dog, bro. Mm-hmm. We saw it prove, like you said, big old gash on the forehead, yet he still keeps the power push and, and gets the TKO, uh, KO finish yeah, in uh, in round three. So, like, 
This was a hard one because one, I was just excited to watch it as a sleeper. I knew this was going to be a banger. These dudes come to fight all the time, but it was one of those moments where you're right. I didn't think it was uh, Kutateladze's best performance or he didn't look like himself going in there. So you got to feel for him. But at the same point, you accepted the, the fight. You signed on the dotted line. You stepped in the cage. It is what it is. Good job to Branner, man. Oh, similar to the Bonfim KO, man. He just got a, a hook straight to his neck. Like, it just, oh, hit the button. Oh. It would take anybody down. Like, that's, that's not a good look. Um, all right, man. Ivana Petrovic, uh, undefeated Norwegian kickboxer, comes into the UFC and then gets just kind of manhandled by Luana Carolina. Not a fantastic way to start off your UFC tenure, but this is kind of what I'm talking about, AJ. When the UFC takes these fighters and they're undefeated and they're super hyped up, she was like a minus 230 betting favorite and then just pretty much got smashed by Carolina. Um, in these spots right here, does that go to show fighters like Carolina, even though maybe not the most highly coveted in the big show? There's levels, bro. She's good. And I think that that's a point that needs to be kind of brought up again. What do you think? That's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, Luana Carolina gets overlooked by a lot of the people in the MMA community. But it just goes to show this girl is a real deal. You can't bring somebody in just in, and, and not saying that Petrovic is off the street. But you can't just bring somebody in and expect her to run over Luana Carolina. But she yeah. is very dangerous and it speaks highly to the rest of the people in the division that made her look bad. Is it? Do you think it's more of that? That, that the rest of the division, even Luana Carolina included, are just that much better? Or is this a Luana Carolina who has improved her game drastically to match that gap? I think it's a little bit of both because if you look at just who Carolina, uh, Carolina, Luana Carolina, there we go. If you look at who she's fought, uh, Joanne Wood, Molly McCann, uh, Lupita Godinez, Pollyanna Botelho, Ariane Lipsky, Priscilla Cachuera. Like you're talking about, these are established names. These are people who have already did their thing in the regional scene and like have fought real people in the UFC. I just think it's a strength of schedule type thing, experience type thing. And that's where you make picks like Max Griffin over Morales, where it's like this dude has seen so much more. He's tenured. Sometimes that doesn't win you the fight, but sometimes it does. And that was a true case here. Um, all right, AJ, last two, and then we'll round it out. Joe Anderson Brito against Weston Wilson. This is jujitsu gone wrong. This is kind of, you know, listen, man, I told you Weston Wilson, or uh, yeah, Weston Wilson had the perfect style to catch uh, Brito on a counter, and I felt like that still rang evident. But when he started going leg locks and submission stuff, he had Brito on a nasty knee bar. He had the knee bar. But that's the problem with uber explosive and strong guys like Brito. You get your knee out just far enough to be able to posture up and smash the guy's face in. And that was an easy. Another, I think, third first round KO um, in a row, man. I mean, Brito is the real deal, right? Brito's a real deal. He went Derek Lewis and said, jiu-jitsu doesn't work. It's not real. This is what happens when you get punched in the face. This was uh, one of the ones, man, where I was literally making a drink for me and my girl, just, you know, chilling back, relaxing. I look up, and I'm like, damn, the fight's done? Like, what? oh, shit, this is fast. Joe Anderson Brito's the real deal, brother. And I will say this, man. This I don't think this was as much as jiu-jitsu doesn't work. This is more of a... When you, I find myself in that position a lot. It's the leg entry where you go to the knee bar. But when you know you no longer have the knee bar, it is on you, it is your onus to then switch positions and attack something different. Instead of hanging out on a knee bar that you no longer have, where you know your only option is to get your face smashed in, you should probably try to reguard or get to a better position. Weston Wilson, he went life or death on the knee bar, and then he lived by the sword. But this time, <laughs> he, he died by the sword on that one. Um, all right, man. King Kong, Alexander Romanov, my man, he got the big win against Blagoy Ivanov. And this was a surprising win. Not surprising because he won, surprising because how he won. I'm expecting big burst Romanov as usual, first two minutes smash dial. I think he maybe respected Ivanov a little bit too much to do that. So what did he do instead, AJ? He kickboxed with him. And my man won a kickboxing match with a couple takedowns in there. Um, still looked like his gas tank was not very good whatsoever still looks like he could probably drop another 20 pounds but what did you make of this win for Romanov I actually liked this win so much more than all of his other wins he's had Derek we were so used to the King Kong smash style of Romanov but that only works against the bottom tier of opponents he was facing you get up to the Blagoys you get up to the top 10 top 15 in there these dudes aren't going down like that. So what do you need to do? You need to get more skilled, rely on your technique, rely on your grit and will and determination and how that fight goes. And that's exactly what this fight showed. 
uh, you're right. Romanov, the gas tank, wasn't there in those late minutes, but he was able to stay mentally there, mentally sound, and not quit on himself. That spoke levels to me. Yeah. I like, like I said, I like this fight a lot more than his other fights, even though the other fights are more entertaining. The finishes are fun to watch, but this proved a character level of Romanov that showed growth, and that's what I like yeah. about it. That's what you want. Now let's just apply that to fight camp and like trimming us down back <laughs> to 240. You know what I'm saying? Then we can be back on the Roman off as the next big deal, you know? But mm -hmm. with that being said, folks, that is a full entire comprehensive breakdown of the entire UFC 76 card or UFC Vegas 76. And there's only one thing left to do. Let's talk about it, AJ. Today, we're, being, we're gonna do a rankings review, baby. Let's go. And we're gonna be talking about the only division that makes sense right now. It is the division that belongs to Israel Adesanya, um, the middleweight division here, AJ. My question here is going to be a stagnant one that we kind of covered a little bit earlier, but it's the only one that makes sense in this division currently. We need to know, Sean Strickland, currently number seven in the division. Derek Brunson is clearly going to be on his way out of this division here soon. Drikus Duplessis gets Robert uh, Whitaker. Cannoneer just beat Vittori. Paulo Costa is fighting a dude outside the rankings, um, you know, in Aliskarov right there. Paeta, no longer here. So all these rankings don't even really make sense, right? But then you get down here, and you look at a Sean Strickland. And we already talked about Paulo Costa, but if that fight's not on the table, you got Brunson, you got Delize, uh, you got Jack Romanson, Brennan Allen, Kevin Gastelum, Nasadin Imovov. He's already fought some of these guys. Of course, he's not going to fight Chris Curtis. Where are we going with middleweight, and what is the state of these middleweight rankings? Because the worst thing that could have happened, sad, sad enough to say, and it's not a bad thing, but it's Israel Adesanya regaining his championship just because we go right back into place of the stagnant division instead of the mix-up that we maybe wanted to see like at light heavyweight. So what is the state of this division currently? Man, it's starting to become a lightweight. It's starting to become the lightweight division where we're only seeing – the stars fight the stars and everybody else just sitting there pecking at crumbs. Because yeah. even looking at this, yeah, I, I agree. The Paulo Costa fight with Sean Strickland, that would be a lot of fun just on a game plan wise. But if we look at something that's a little more realistic, if you will, um, what are we talking? Delize, he's beat Brandon Allen. Uh, Jack Hermanson, he beat Jack Hermanson. Kelvin Glassel might be interesting. He's beat Imavov. Andre Muniz might be interesting. <laughs> But you're right. There's not really much going on that's like pushing the needle, if you will. So as, as a state of the whole division in general, it seems to be dying out because you're right. When you have a killer at the top, it's it's hard to really stay hungry yeah. because there's nothing else going on. I'd be I'd, I'm still uh, not mind blown, but interested to see why the Robert Whitaker and Drikas Duplessis fight is actually taking place. Because I think I think Whitaker takes it right off the jump before any you know tape or anything. But I think that'd make a good fight. Drikas Duplessis, Sean Strickland, it's building them up. They're kind of a little closer. What do you think, Derek? Is the, is the middleweight division truly lost in this limbo section I'm talking about? Until we have a new champion, I would say so. Because Israel Adesanya is very quickly running out of people to fight. And he's literally saying, he was like, let Paeta get the 205 belt and I'll move back up to 205 and I'll try it again, give it another shot. I just think that Adesanya, man, he's, I think he only has so many more fights on his, on his belt left, man, just because you don't have anything else to prove, man. You're the you two-time middleweight champ. You beat everybody decisively. What's next? You know what I mean? You knocked out the big rival boogeyman guy that's plagued your career. What's next? Um, a win over Drikas Duplessis, a third win over Whitaker beat Sean Strickland. Ooh, you know, like it doesn't, I don't know, man. It's, it's, a, it's a weird limbo state that we're in. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, folks, that's why we're excited that next week, international fight week, baby, right here in Vegas. Uh, or is this, I don't know if this fight is happening in Vegas. I would imagine it's international fight week, but either way, I'm going to go over there to UFC X. We're going to go commingle with the fighters, do the fun stuff in preparation for Alexander Volkanovsky versus Yair Rodriguez. Now, AJ, this is going to be a fun one. We're also going to see Brandon Moreno versus Alexandre Pantoja, two belts on the line lots at stake here i mean how are you feeling for this next uh, upcoming card bro excited derek and yes we have the whitaker duplessis fight as well but we also get to see bo nickel return derek i'm excited we've been needing a pay-per-view and uh fight international fight week is always a great time this looks like it's going to be a great card like you said dan turner jalen hooker this card is stacked folk this is the card all the casuals have been waiting for. Yeah. But tune in because you know what kind of casual, or you know the, the diehards over here on the bloody water will be breaking it down, giving you the best picks possible. 
And listen, folks, this is my last PSA to you. It's okay to be a casual. Go ahead and be a casual. Just tune into the people who are actually like knee deep in this thing so we can give you the correct information, right? Yeah, this week might not have been the best testament, but if you follow us over a track record, you know we're hitting the sleepers before they come to become the stars. We're hitting on the picks that everybody is siding the other way. Listen, lots of good stuff at store. One more time, follow my man AJ on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Santa Fe Bomber. Subscribe, maybe it's the best term to use, right? Um, if Elon Musk decides to open Twitter back up, you can give me a follow on Twitter at twitter.com slash D496 underscore. Aside from that, Bloody Water Podcast is the home, the hub, everywhere you, where you need to go to get all the information you need. So subscribe, right? Hit the website, bloodywaterpodcast.com. AJ, any last words before we head up out of here? Yeah, folks, we say it in the beginning because we're trying to get that cheap pop. There's people that are looking in the beginning, but if you've made it this far, you were a true fan, a true community member. Make sure you're sharing it with your friends. You're the people we love. You're the people we appreciate. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So make sure you spread that love, spread the money, and let's go get some checks on this UFC 290 fight. There's a lot of big fights coming. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, folks, that's it for us. Catch us on Friday for the preview show, International Fight Week. Until next time. Peace. Thank you.